Go ahead and grab a seat. We're so glad that you are here today. Today, uh, uh, we are in part six of our series, Worst Case Scenario. And what we've been doing is we've been talking about how do you survive like your worst day ever? And we've been looking really to the example of Jesus on his worst day ever when they crucified him. And while he was there hanging on the cross, Jesus made seven different statements that serve kind of as life lessons for us to help us navigate, uh, you know, the really bad days. Anybody ever have a really bad day, <laughs> right? Okay. Are you having one today? I hope not. But if you are, you are in the right place. Come on. There's no better place to be. Come on. On your worst day ever than in the house of the Lord. Come on. I pray you're encouraged uh, today. But um, the theme verse uh, for the series is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, and it says this, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finish the race that we are in. See, he was in the same race that we're in. He not only started it, but man, he finished it. Aren't you thankful? Come on, we serve a God who finishes what he starts. And it says then, so study how he did it. That's what we're doing in the series. We're studying how Jesus, how he handled his worst day ever. Because, you know, Jesus, he went through the same kind of stuff that you and I go through. He faced the same kind of adversities and trials and problems and, you know, things that, that you and I experience in life as well. But yet he finished it. It goes on and he says this um, in, the, in the next part of the verse. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. In another part of Hebrews, it talks about how Jesus right now, he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he is making intercession for you and for me. That as we pray, Jesus hears that prayer and he takes that prayer right to the heart of creator God and he's interceding. Isn't that good to know today? I'm telling you what, man, I'm glad that you pray for me and I'm glad I can pray for you, but there's nothing like knowing, come on, that Jesus, come on, he's praying for you today. He is pulling for you today. He's cheering you on in heaven today. He's like, you got this. I'm going to help you. My father's going to help you. And so we, we have been studying uh, these seven different statements that Jesus made from the cross. And if you've missed any of the last five weeks, please just go online and you can watch uh, those messages uh, on demand there. But today we come to the sixth statement. That Jesus made. The sixth statement is this. It's found in uh, John chapter 19, uh, verse 30. When he received, oops, yep, you were right. You got it. You, oh, whew, there, yes, there it is. All right. When he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. Now, a lot of people mistakenly believe that this is the last thing that Jesus said from the cross. But it's not. He has actually one more thing to say. And we're going to study that next week. But just to put this in a little bit of context, it says when he received the drink, we talked about that last week, that when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning. And um, he made the first four statements within the first three hours. And right about noon, uh, the Bible says that that's when he makes the fourth statement because the supernatural... um, event takes place while he's hanging on the cross. He's been there for three hours. And then right at noon when the, the, the sun was the highest in the sky and was shining its brightest, at that moment, darkness covers the whole city of Jerusalem. And it was in that moment that Jesus, he made um, the fourth statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me. And we studied that together. Go back and listen to it if you missed it. And then Jesus, now he hangs in silence for the next three hours as that darkness covers that city of David. He hangs there in silence and says nothing until just the last few moments of his life. Before he breathes his last breath, he makes his final three statements before he slips into heaven. We looked at that last week, the first of those last three, are you with me? Are you with me? Say amen. Are you with me? So the first of the last three statements, five, six, and seven, we looked at five last week. And it says that when Jesus was crucified at nine in the morning, they offered him a drink. 
It was uh, wine mixed with myrrh. It was a, it was a narcotic. It was a painkiller used to, you know, sedate him. But he refused to take that drink because he didn't want to be sedated when he took on the sins of humanity. He wanted to feel the full weight of that which he was doing, that he who knew no sin would become sin in that moment so that we could become the righteousness of God. So he refused the first drink. But after it says, uh, uh, right at the, the moment, uh, uh, at the end, when it says the work w- uh, had been accomplished, that he had taken on sin, he had become literally sin. That We said last week, Jesus didn't just die for you. He died as though he were you. He became sin. He became that lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth were laid. He, he took the penalty upon himself, the perfect one, without spot or blemish, this perfect lamb of God. The innocent one takes the hit for the guilty one so that you and I could go free. And once that worked, yeah, come on, if you want to clap, give him praise. That's good. And it says then, when they offered him the second drink, it says he received that drink. So after he takes it to his lips, It says that he makes now his sixth statement. It is finished. In the Greek, that word is tetelestai. Tetelestai. Can you say that with me? Tetelestai. Say it again. Come on. Tetelestai. Listen, you're all learning Greek, man. Look at you, smart people here, smartest people in the Poconos. Tetelestai. It is finished. He, he says, take telestai. It is finished. And I assure you, friend, that this was not, this was not the cry of a helpless victim. This was the shout of a victor. And when he said that, when that Tastelestai thundered from his lips. It ricocheted through the corridors of heaven and hell, and it caused all of the angels to rejoice and all of the demons in hell to shudder in fear. Tastelestai. See, Satan's chokehold on humanity in that moment had come to an end. No more being separated from God. No more would sin reign here on earth unchecked. No more would death be able to terrorize God's prized possession. Telestai, it is finished. In fact, when he says this, Mark's gospel tells us when he gives the account of Jesus' crucifixion that the, ex- the Roman executioner at the foot of the cross, when he hears this word, te- telestai, it causes salvation within this Roman executioner to rise up and he declares, surely this is the Son. And in that moment, that Roman soldier puts his faith and declaration in Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. You say, what what does that mean, it is finished? What does that mean, tetelestai? It was a very common word in Jesus' day. It was used every day. It It was used by employees when they were working for their boss. You know, if you're out there and you're building a deck Or if you're on the job doing something, whatever it is that you do, and when the job was done, you go back to the boss and say, hey, take telestai. It's finished. It's done. It was used by by artists. If you were painting a, a picture, and when the artist was done, when they said, man, this is perfect. We don't need to add anything else. Just leave it alone. The artist would say, it's take telestai. It was used by, um, by bankers. You know, when you would take out a loan. Anybody ever take out a loan on anything? You all know what that's like? I owe, I owe. So off to work I go. <laughs> Debt can be an amazing motivator, can't it? Trying to pay that sucker down. Just throwing a little bit at it that you can, right? You all know what I'm talking about? And 
when you made that final payment and you went to the bank, they would take a stamp and they would stamp it, Tetelestai. It's done. Paid in full. It is finished. Tetelestai. In fact, um, it was also a word that was used by priests. Did you know that? In fact, it was a word that the priests, in the very moment Jesus said it, were also saying it just less than a mile away at the temple. At the very hour, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the great um, historian Josephus confirms this, that as Jesus, the Lamb of God, is dying for the sins of the world, overlooking on the hill called Golgotha Calvary, the Temple Mount itself. And he says, Tetelestai. At the, va- at the exact same time, there were the priests that were in the temple. See, was, this took place um, during the full moon, during the Passover celebration, where spiritual pilgrims would come from all over the land. And they would go to celebrate Passover in the city of Jerusalem. And they would bring a sacrifice for Passover. And that sacrifice was a lamb. But not just any lamb. It had to be a perfect lamb. It couldn't have a crooked nose. It couldn't have any scabs. It couldn't have a a cut on its ear. It had had no scars of any kind. It had had to be blameless and without any blemish. It couldn't have any spots on it. And as they would bring that Passover land, remember, celebrating their deliverance from Egypt, when the angel of death would come and pass over any house that had the blood of the lamb over the doorposts. And so as Jesus is there at the same hour, 3 o'clock, from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, the the spiritual pilgrims would bring their lambs to the temple to be sacrificed as the priests would inspect those lambs. If the lamb passed inspection and it was perfect, the priest would say, Tetelestai. It's perfect. It's done. It's finished. And then they would take the knife and as they were slitting the throats of thousands of lambs and the blood flowed through the streets The Lamb of God, Jesus himself, hung on the cross, and he said, it is finished. Te telestai. Te telestai. Aren't you glad we serve a God, come on, who finishes what he starts? We have a God, come on, who is faithful even when we are unfaithful. Come on, he is faithful even when we are unholy. Come on, he is holy. Even when we're inconsistent, he is consistent. And he shouts at the top of whatever voice he had left. Te telestai. You know, he makes this statement, it is finished. But yet he's still there. Hanging on the cross. Still breathing. Still bleeding still suffering, in pain. But yet he says, wait a minute, it is finished. But he's not yet died. Like, help me understand this. How can Jesus say it is finished before he's even given his life completely while he's still in pain? Like, Jesus, are you trying to tell us you know something that we don't know? Like, Jesus, are you trying to tell us that God, even though in the midst it looks really bad, it looks really bad, a bloody mess, unrecognizable, helpless and hopeless, it looks in that moment like this is the end. It's over. There's no coming back from this. But yet Jesus says it is is finished. In other words, gang, I know it might look bad right here, right now, but my Father in heaven is still up to something. He's still working behind the scenes because he sees the beginning from the end. And I know it looks bad right now, but Jesus says in this pain, there is 
purpose, for I have seen beyond the cross for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross for the joy that he knew that three days later he would pick his life back up again and he would reign and he would rule in victory, conquering death, even itself. It is finished. It's finished. I know it doesn't look like it's finished, but I know the end from the beginning. And I'm here to tell you today, listen, some of you, you're in pain. Some of you, your worst days turn into a worst season. And you've been in it far longer than you ever thought. This thing has lasted so much longer than you ever thought it would last. But I'm here to tell you, there's purpose in your pain. And that pain is coming to an end. For it is finished. There is purpose to your pain. Yes, pain is part of your story. And it's part of mine too. It's part of your story. But it's not the end of your story. This was not the end of his story. This was in the middle of it. And yet he still says it is finished because, gang, there's stuff I know that you don't know. There's things that are happening behind the scenes that you don't see right now, that you don't feel right now, that you don't hear right now. But Jesus knew. He knew. I know this looks bad, but it's finished. Because I see what's happening next. Listen, don't give up hope today. This is life lesson number six. I want you to know today, here's, here, here's what I want you to be assured of. That there is a purpose and that there is an end to your pain. There is a purpose and there is an end to your pain. And I hope and, and I pray today that when you leave this place, and perhaps you won't have all the answers to your problems all the solutions to your situation. But I'll certainly pray for that. But my hope and my prayer is that today you would leave this place with a blessed assurance. God knows what he's doing. That he's in charge. That this pain, this problem is part of your story, but it's not the end of your story. Your final chapter has not yet been written, but we can still have assurance today that it is finished in Jesus' name. Now, I think the story that best uh, illustrates this truth uh, is found in the Old Testament. It's actually the oldest story in the Bible. You'd think it would be in the book of Genesis, but it's not. Because if you're a Bible person, you know that the Bible is not actually organized in a chronological fashion. It's organized by types of literature. Narrative history, for instance, prophetic literature, poetic uh, literature. And this story is found in the, in the uh, poetic literature. And it's really the story of a man named Job. Does anybody know Job's story? Anybody? All right, like 12 of you. Awesome. Well, you're going to learn something today. All right, the rest of you. All right, and maybe those that you know the story, you, you might learn something, something too, because this book of Job, it's found in this poetic uh, 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 type of, of, of organization of books uh, in the Old Testament, because it's full of poetry, it's full of metaphor. It really, it actually, the first two chapters uh, really tell the whole story, and, and they're, they're written in a narrative historical form, but then the next, like, 38-something chapters is all this poetry, and if you love poetry, you'd love it. It's a little bit hard to read, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. If you've never read it, maybe you should read it, you know, this week or later this afternoon if you, if you want to, but since so many of you don't know the story. Let me just give you a little, you know, snippet, a little synopsis of, of the story of Job. Job was a devout man. He's a really religious guy. He was a faithful guy. He loved God, and he served God faithfully, he served his family faithfully. In fact, he became wildly successful, one of the richest men that ever lived. He had a big family, lots of kids. He had a huge business. He had amassed more money um, than you and I could spend in 10 lifetimes. This guy had, like, legacy money. But then he had a very, very, very bad day. And one day he lost it all. He lost his house. He lost his kids. He lost his businesses. He lost all of his money. He lost it all, even his health. 
He lost it all, everything, except his wife. Some of you know the story. You're laughing. And, you know, it's like the devil is like, you know, he took everything away from Job except his wife. I can almost hear the demon saying, hey, should we get her next now? And the devil's like, nah, I know what I'm doing. Just leave her. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying she was not a very nice person. You read the story, and you find this guy on his worst day ever. He's literally, he's sitting on a pile of ash. His body is, he's lost everything. All his kids, all, everybody he loved, his employees, his businesses, his money. He's sitting there at rock bottom. Now his body is covered in boils and sores, and he picks up a shard of broken pottery just to scrape his skin. And then his wife says to him, hey, Job, why don't you just curse God and die already? <laughs> what a peach she was, right? And so that's the, really the, the story of Job. And, you know, you read the first couple chapters and you kind of get the gist of the whole thing. But then you, you spend the next, like, 36, 38 chapters, you know, basically you could boil it all down, all that poetry and all that metaphor. You can kind of summarize the whole story. Basically, it's just him and he's got some so-called friends. And basically what he does for 36, 38 chapters is he complains to God and he complains about God and he questions God. So it's just a lot of complaining, and it's a lot of questioning. Complaining about God and questioning God. In fact, I think you can summarize the whole story in Job chapter 30, uh, verse 20, when Job says this. He says, I'll just read it over here. I call to you, O God. Like on my worst day ever, when my life completely falls apart. And I get sucker punched. I mean, a real body blow, you know, rug just literally ripped out from underneath my feet. Didn't see it coming. And I called to you, God, on my worst day ever. But you never answer. Whew. You ever been there? I've been, oh, I've been there. Me too. Ever felt that way? Like, where are you, God? Be like, seriously? You don't even listen to me? You never listen to me anyway. He, he exaggerates a little bit, and that's what we do in our pain, don't we? Because we know, like, you never listen to me? That's a little bit, that's a little too far now. Come on. It's a bridge a little bit too far, Job, isn't it? But in our pain, don't we exaggerate? And that's where he was. And I've been there too. Probably you have too. And if you haven't, Joel, just keep get up tomorrow. <laughs> you know, just keep living. It'll happen. It's just part of life. This is just what happens. Doesn't make you good, doesn't make you bad, just makes you human. And he gets to this place, and I'm like, you know, you don't even look my way. You know, when I pray, you pay no attention. It's like you, you, you're not even, you're so far off, you're doing other stuff, you don't care. You don't care about what's going on in my life, God. You don't care about what's going on in my family. You don't care about what's going on in my business or my finances or my school. Or my church, you just look the other way. You don't ever pay any attention. And basically, Job, he just goes on and on and on like this for like 36 chapters. I mean, complaining. Arguing. Complaining some more. Questioning God with this attitude. And I get it, he's hurting. And I've been there too. But then, you know, after 36 chapters, you know, after 36 chapters, it's like, God, you, you don't listen to me anyway. I pray. I don't know why I pray to you. And by the way, I can, you know, do a whole lot better job being God than you can because, you know, I mean, that's basically what he's saying. You just read it. He says it in a more poetical nature. But he's like, I can certainly do a better job of being God than you. Hey, no offense, but seriously, you know, give me the wheel. I know what to do better than you do. I know more what's going on here than you do. And I could fix this if I were you. And here's what I would do. Have you ever been there? I've been there. I've said those things to God myself. I know that of which I speak today. It's not just Job's story. It's my story. It's probably your story if you're willing to be vulnerable enough and honest enough when you're in those places in life. But after 36 chapters, God is like, you want an answer, bro? <laughs> I'll give you an answer. Look at this. I love it. 
He goes on and says, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. I just love that. Out of the storm. He said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Whoa. Uh Uh-oh. Like, who's got these questions about stuff you don't even know about? God's got a little attitude. He's just like, had it up to here. Right? Who is it? And Job's like, uh, it's me. Job, in other words, you're talking about stuff you don't even know about. You're complaining about stuff you don't even know what's going on. I mean, you're, you're only looking at a snapshot of where you are right now, Job, and you don't even know what's coming next. You don't know what I have planned for your future. You're just reacting out of the moment, and there's a whole lot more going on that you don't even have knowledge of. Look, he goes on. Listen to this. Listen to this. This is a great, this is a great interaction. This gets, it, gets, uh, it gets spicy. Brace yourself like a man, Job. Like, you better buckle up, bro, because you got questions for me. Well, I got some questions for you, and you will answer me. Woo! God is like, woo! He is, he is like, man, okay, let's see what's going on. Oh, this is spicy. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you don't read the Bible, man, you, you, you're missing out. There's some really good stuff. Some really good stuff. Oh, go back, go back, go back. Uh, go back. Okay. Where were you? This is God. Now, where, you got questions? I got a question for you, bro. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you? Mr. I know everything. Mr. I can be a better God than you can be. Where were you? He goes on. Listen, I love it. He gets really sarcastic. He says, tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Well, surely you know, Job. Because you were there. Like, you knew how I spoke this whole world, this universe, and the multiple universes and the ever-expanding universe, even to this day. Like, you were there. Like, you, you know. Why don't you tell me, professor? Oh, it gets better. Keep going. <laughs> Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Like, come on, Cletus. Tell me, Mr. Smarty Pants. What is the way to the abode of light, and where does the darkness reside? Come on, let's talk about light. Let's talk about darkness. Where did it come from? Where's it going? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths of their dwellings? Well, surely you know, for you were already born, Job. Who God is like getting super sarcastic now. He goes, oh, yeah, you have lived so many years. Job, you're so old and wise. Why don't you tell me how it all works? Do you hear God? God's funny, bro. If you, if you don't think God's funny, uh, you don't know God, at least the God that I know. Because he's just dropping it on Job. And he gets sarcastic. And in this moment, Job does what all of us do. Like whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, whether you're a person of faith or not, you're going to do exactly what I would do, exactly what Job did in this case. You're going to realize in this moment, when you're in this situation, you don't know what you thought you knew. I mean, you thought you knew a lot of stuff. But you're going to realize in this moment, boy, you don't know as much as you thought you knew. Because Job answers him. And that's what he says in chapter 40. Then Job answered the Lord, I'm unworthy. How can I even respond? How can I reply to you? And then it says he covered his mouth with his hand. I'm like, oh boy. I certainly put my foot in my mouth there, didn't I? Boy, I certainly shot off my mouth before I loaded my brain, didn't I? I was talking about stuff I didn't know about. And God just reminded me. That he's really big and I'm really small. And he made it all. I don't even know how he made it. And who am I to question him about what's going on in my life? Who am I? I don't have all of the details. I, I'm not like God. I can't see the end from the beginning. And Job, he starts to, to back 
track. And he's like, oh, man, you know, God, my bad. I'm sorry. I got nothing here to say. I'm just going to cover my, my mouth. And I, the reality is about life is how little we really know. There's just some things that you and I don't know and that we may never, ever know. Why certain things happen? Did God cause it? Did God allow it? I don't know. You don't know. And in Job 42, Job makes three statements about God that actually become very foundational to Christian theology. And so if you want to take some notes, I'm just going to give you these real three real quick and then we'll get you out of here and enjoy the rest of your day. Three things about God. He makes this statement, Job 42, look at it. Verses one through five. So then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. Remember, this guy's life just fell apart. Talk about worst day ever. The house just burnt down with the kids in it. But I know, God, you can do all things. There's no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Look, go on, and he says, basically it was me, and I'm an idiot. Surely I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me to know. But my, uh, my ears have heard of you, but now... My eyes have seen you. Even though he was a devout man, a religious man, a man of faith, his relationship up until this point was that he had heard about God. But now through this encounter, he says, my eyes have seen you. This is more personal. This is now more intimate, his relationship with God. So Job gives us three things in this statement about God. The first thing, and if you're going to make it through your worst day, just like Job, and just like Jesus, you need to remember this about God, that God is all-powerful. God is all-powerful. Now, the Greek word for that is omnipotent. Omni means all, potent means power, so God has all power. I mean, Job said, God, there's nothing that is impossible for you to do. So on your worst day ever, you need to remember just like your buddy Job. I know this looks bad. I know this looks hopeless. I know it looks like I'm helpless, that there's nothing I can do to change. There's no way I can recover from this. We need to remember we serve an all Powerful, come on, omnipotent God who can do all things. What is impossible with men, come on, somebody, is possible with God. It's possible with Him because there's nothing He can't do. There's no purpose of God that can be thwarted. That God, you are big and you can do whatever you want, you can do it wherever you want. You can do it whenever you want and however you want to do it because, God, you're calling the shots. You got the power and I don't. So, God, I'm looking to you today. I'm fixing my eyes on you today, on my very bad, horrible, no good day. I'm going to remind myself and speak, come on, to my spirit that God is an all-powerful, mighty, working God who can do all things. He's all-powerful. Listen, I don't, I don't, all I know is all power is in his hands. And some of you might say, well, why didn't he, why didn't he use it? I don't know. Why doesn't he do something about it? I don't know. Why doesn't he heal him? I don't know. Why doesn't he change her? I don't know. But here's what I know today. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For everything, absolutely everything, everything got started in him. That's Jesus. And everything finds its purpose in him. He goes on and he says in the next verse, he was there before any of it came into existence. And Jesus holds it all together right up until this moment. Come on. Jesus has got, come on, the whole world in his hand. Your world, my world, our world. He holds it all together because he is all powerful. He is the visible image of the invisible God. And he loves you and he's for you today. And I can't understand it all, but I do know this. 
This isn't the end of the story. There's some other chapters yet to be written in your story. So don't make some flippant decisions about God when you're right here in the middle because you don't know where it's going to end. Come on. It is finished. And he can say that in the middle because he sees the end from the beginning. So don't give up. That pain is part of your story, but it's not all of your story. That problem you're in right now, it's part of your story, but it's not all of your story because you serve an all-powerful God, come on, who can work miracles and signs and wonders on your behalf. Stay in the game. He's an all-powerful God. Here's the second thing Job says. God is a, he is an all-knowing God. He's an all-knowing God. That, that word in theology um, is an omniscient God. Omni, all, omniscient, science, knowledge. God has all science. He has all knowledge. God has a corner on all truth because he is truth. There is nothing that God doesn't know. He's an all-knowing God. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about your history. He knows everything about your, your family, where you come from. From the very beginning to the very end, he knows it all. He knows the struggles. He knows the tears you cry at night when you lay your head on your pillow. He knows it all. There's nothing that he doesn't know. He's an all-knowing, all-powerful God. Yeah, you know some stuff. He knows it all. I know some stuff, but he knows everything. That's why it says in, in the book of Isaiah 57, I don't know who this might be for today. It, it talks about that the, in Isaiah 57 that, that the young, sometimes young good people die before their appointed time. You ever lost somebody that was young? You say, oh, they died before their time. Their appointed time. Well, my question is, who's appointed time? Yours? What you think it should be? Or God's? And I just know that sometimes God, he takes people home before their appointed time. At least in our eyes. Like, oh, they were way too young. Sometimes God pe takes people home as an act of his grace to spare people, even godly people, for what is yet to come. And I know it hurts, and I know it's hard because we can't see it, but God sees the end, come on, from the beginning. He's all-powerful, but he's also all-knowing. And that's where you just trust. In the situation. It says this in Hebrews 4.13. He knows about everyone. Everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from him. See, God knows everything. And I think Job, would, if he could stand here today, would say, how dare we ever question an all-knowing and an all-powerful God. How can we ask things about stuff we don't even know about when all we have right now is what's here and right, what's now right in front of us? And that's why I would say this to you. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to an all-knowing God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to an all-knowing God. God, because God knows. I don't know. You don't know. God knows. Come on, aren't you thankful today? His ways are higher than our ways. Come on, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Like even when we have our best thoughts, our most smartest thoughts of all the smartest people that have ever lived, when you think about that, that's just where God is getting started because he's so big and powerful and all-knowing. Last of all, I want to say this, that God, he's not only all-powerful and all-knowing, but God is ever-present. He's ever-present. There's nowhere that you can go that God's not already there because he's an ever-present God. The, the theological word for that is omnipresent, all-presence. 
God is everywhere. The Bible talks about this. He says, if I go up, the psalmist says, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, you are there. Am I getting up and am I lying down? Am I going out? Am I coming in? God, you know it all because you're there. There's no place I could ever go, God, that you're not there because he's an all ever present. Come on, God, he's an ever present, even help in a time of trouble. Jesus said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Come on, he is with you. He is with you. He is with you. Psalm 46, he is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in a time of trouble. When I know that, on my worst day ever, when my life falls apart in front of my eyes, when I know God is with me, I can face whatever is against me. When you know God is with you, you can face whatever is against you. I want you to know today the God inside of you is greater than the giant that's in front of you. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. And he's all present. So I want to encourage somebody today. And I want to speak prophetically over you. That a spirit of tetelestai would rest upon you today. A spirit of knowing deep down inside your heart. When your heart is broken, when there are things that are happening that you can't explain, speak that word over your life. Tetelestai. It is finished. I, mo I know it might not look finished. He was still hanging, dying on the cross, hadn't breathed his last breath, but Jesus, he declared it. It's finished. In other words, God, you see the end from the beginning. You know what's going to happen three days from now. My pain has a purpose, and it's coming to an end. Your pain has a purpose. It's part of your story, but it's not all of your story. He's still writing. He's still writing. And I know it might look bad right now, and I know it doesn't seem good, but he's still writing. This isn't the end of your story. You're still in the middle, but you can still, with faith and confidence, declare today, Tetelestai, it is finished. Knowing that God loves you. Come on, if he be for you, who can be against you? That no, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor width, or breadth, nor angels, nor demons. Nothing can separate you from from the love of God. He loves you. He's for you. He is with you. He knows it all. He sees it all. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't lose faith. Keep trusting him. Keep serving him. Let's keep serving one another. Let's keep serving our community. Let's keep serving those that are most vulnerable among us. Let's just keep doing what we know to do is right and know that we know that we know. Tetelestai. It's finished. In God's book, it's finished. That he works all things for the good of those who love him, come on, and are called according to his purpose. When I can't, and when I can't trace his hand, like when I can't understand, why? What in the world? God, why? When I can't trace his hand, I gotta just trust his heart. Here's God's heart. He loves you so much. He is for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans not to hurt you or harm you, but plans to give you hope plans to give you a future. That's God's heart. I love you. I'm for you. I've got plans to help you. So you remember that on your worst day ever. He's all-powerful.
He's all knowing. And he's ever present. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. Pray, God, that your word would bring comfort, that it would bring hope. I know that you are close to the brokenhearted, that you heal those that are crushed in spirit, and that some of us, among us today, crushed in spirit. So on this worst day ever for some of us, remind us of these truths today. Let them sink, settle deep into our heart. For those of us that aren't there today, help us to memorize this and store it away and so we can access it on the day that trouble does come. Because you said in this world, you will have trouble. But do not fear, for I have overcome. Bless your people today.